afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from here today. Thank you for joining our weekly Tuesday live stream. Uh, this is a weekly tr transformation or digital transformation focused live stream where we interview different guests and talk about different topics related to digital transformation. Um, this interview actually becomes part of our weekly transformation ground control podcast. So you're getting to see sort of the live production uh, behind the scenes here today. So thank you for, for joining. Uh, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stages of digital transformation success. And I'm excited for today's guest, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. But before I introduce our guest, uh, just a couple of logistical items. First of all, um, this is meant to be a very interactive conversation. So our goal here today is to cover um, a topic that I'll discuss here in just a moment, but the goal here is to get as many questions and interactions from the audience as possible. So any any sorts of, of uh, questions or comments you have for either myself or our guest, please feel free to chime in at any point, and uh, we'll get to your questions as we're going through the conversation here today. Uh, secondly, if you could just drop in the chat and let us know where you're joining from today. What part of the world are you joining? What city are you in? What country are you in? We typically draw a global audience for these live events, so we'd love to hear where you're all from today. So if you wouldn't mind just dropping in the chat where you're joining from today, I'd love to love to hear your feedback um, on that and get a feel for, for where you're all from. Um, so today's topic that we are going to discuss is how to avoid CIO failure. And the subtitle to that is Lessons for CIOs, IT Managers, and Transformation Leaders. And the whole idea or the whole concept we want to discuss today is, first of all, what are some of the challenges of being a CIO or an IT leader within an organization, whether you're going through some sort of formalized transformation or whether you're just managing sort of the status quo, what are some of those challenges of being a uh, chief information officer, chief digital officer, IT director, IT manager, or any sort of IT leader in an organization? What are some of the, the biggest challenges that or, that individuals are facing? So that's really the, the focus we wanted to hone in on here today. And this is actually building on a, a topic that we discussed a few weeks ago on this live stream, which is also available on our, our Transformation Ground Control podcast. Um, and actually, we had the same guest for that discussion, which is discussing the evolving role of a CIO and how the CIO's role is evolving over time and how it's changing. So we sort of wanted to build on that and discuss that in a little bit more detail, but really dive into how to avoid failure because CIOs typically have a, have a bullseye on them oftentimes, and they're under a lot of pressure to align the people process and technology pieces of their, their organization. So really wanted to dive into what is, what does it take to make a, a CIO or IT manager successful? How can they better um, lead and manage change? And what are some of the lessons learned and pitfalls that we've seen with our, our clients throughout the organization or throughout the world? So that's really the, the focus of what we want to discuss here today. And joining me for uh, this discussion is a guest that we've had on in the past. Um, several weeks ago or several episodes ago of this podcast, we had him on here. And that is uh, Ridwan Bardian, who is uh, the director or one of the directors of our third stage consulting South Africa or Africa office. So he is part of the the African footprint and in, in our team on the ground in Africa. So uh, Ridwan, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Eric. And uh, yeah, great to be back again. It feels like yeah, it was thanks. yesterday. Yeah, well, it, well, yeah, it was just a few short weeks ago that you, you were on the show. And so thanks for, for being back. In fact, we had such a good conversation and there's so much we didn't cover in that conversation. We thought let's continue it and maybe put a little bit different spin on it here um, today. Yeah. Um, before we jump into the questions, though, maybe just tell us a little bit about your background, uh, both, you know, what you do now at Third Stage, but also what you did prior to joining Third Stage. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, um, and thanks for having me once again. Um, I actually quite enjoyed the last interaction, and uh, I got some good feedback. So <laughs> let's hope we can we can have the same kind of conversation today. Um, yeah. So um, at third stage, I'm based in Johannesburg. As those of you in uh, South Africa, that's why it's, it's very very cold here. It does get cold in Africa. <laughs> it just doesn't snow um, only in certain places. Um, so as a director at third stage, uh, I work with uh, companies on their digital transformation projects. So anything from strategy all the way to software selection and business process reengineering, as well as which is very, very important and always over, overlooked is, uh, is, is change management. So prior to joining um, third stage, I was an executive partner at Gartner for about five years. And in there, at, at any point in time, you have a portfolio of about 30 
CIOs, uh, C-level executives or CDOs. And part of that role was also a bit of coaching, uh, coaching and mentoring. But also prior to that, I also held about I think, yeah, two, two roles as a chief information officer. So um, I bring the theory and uh, I also bring the practical um, uh, aspects of it. Yeah, you've been you've been sort of a, a CIO whisperer uh, over the years in terms of coaching and guiding and helping CIOs through uh, pretty right. complex transformations, which is really what we want to dive into here today. Mm-hmm. Um, well, sure. good. Well, that's great to hear. And, and just to um, spotlight our audience here before I jump into the questions. Um, thank you, Diane, on LinkedIn, joining from South Africa as well. Um, uh, Gaspar LaRocca on LinkedIn, joining from Baltimore. Uh, we have... Uh, someone joining Ursula joining from from London, um, Audra from from Atlanta, uh, Don from Tampa. Thanks for being here. Um, Sam Graham from Spain. Thank you for being here again today, Sam. And um, just a general comment before we get started. Um, and this is actually a, an interesting thing to keep in the back of our minds as we're talking here today, Ridwan. And this is a, I like the topic for today. I've been looking into becoming something like a CIO, CTO, or something similar. So learning a lot from these discussions, and that's really what we hope we'll we'll uh, discuss with you here today is just what does it take to be successful? What are some of the pitfalls and challenges and lessons learned? And and how can we really set you all up for success, whether you're a CIO now or whether you're aspiring to be one? If you're a consultant and you work with CIOs, um, or if you're just, you know, just generally trying to understand how CIOs fit into the greater scheme of things, that's really what we want to dive into here today. Um, I guess just to get started, though, um, just to set the context or the, or the backdrop for the discussion, maybe just tell us a little bit about what what are the general responsibilities of a CIO? And when I say CIO, by the way, I'm going to kind of use that interchangeably to include chief digital officer, IT manager, IT director, or just sort of the, the IT leader within an organization. So what, yeah. what exactly does that CIO role do typically in an organization? So if you look at it traditionally, right, I think it started in the 80s when they first came up with the role um, and, it, and, it, and it came out of what uh, fin- the financial services part of the organization. So it's literally looking after information, things like that. Um, and interestingly enough, you, you still find that CIOs are reporting to CFOs. So I, I'm a little wary of putting everybody in the same box so but i get what you're saying like what what do they actually look after so uh, the, sh- the 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 short answer would be um it's the it's the information technology portion of the business right so so it's the traditional stuff it's the the, the infrastructure the networks um the vendor management the erp system um but we have seen that that is no longer if i can use the word good enough for, for organizations because you ha- you have to be competitive and in today's world, to be competitive, we find that is that's where that's where the CDO role has come about. Is that it's now chasing revenue, looking at different business models, still using technology, but your focus is not so much about uptime and things like that. So, but I, I find that that, that generally, um, and, and at Gartner, I, I work globally, so it is a global perspective that I'm giving. I, I still find that a lot of CIOs are still stuck in the back office and seen in that role. I find that a lot of that's still happening. Um, just as a matter of interest, um, uh, with shadow IT, uh, for those who don't know, is when a business goes off and does its own thing. And I remember um, as a CIO allowing that to happen. And when I was at Gartner, we also had research that said allow that to happen because that's the other thing that's starting to impact on, on CIOs. Is that role is now coming more and more in, into the spotlight. So yes, even though I say that's what your portfolio is, be aware that that in, it's already started that that should no longer be your portfolio, depending where you are, in which organization you, you're in, if right. that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it seems like that there's really, in my mind, there's two major buckets of functions or responsibility that a CIO has. You have the stuff you're talking about, which is sort of the back office um, systems focus, keep the lights on, keep things running, maintain the systems, fix them when they break, sort of that maintenance focused support and maintenance focus side of the, the equation. But then the other side of the equation is the more strategic or proactive side of things, which is how do you continuously improve your business and ensure that you're leveraging new technologies where appropriate and getting ahead of just fixing and breaking or fixing stuff that's Correct. broken, but really more strategically deploying new technologies throughout an organization. So it seems like there's two sort of very different areas of focus that a CIO typically is responsible for. 
So, so what do you think the most important skills are given this backdrop? And we'll talk more about how the role's changing and how the skill sets required are, are changing, but what, what are the yeah. major skills that a, that a CIO typically needs to be successful in that role? So if I look at the, the, the CIO and the CDO role, you'll find that they are um, a lot more politically savvy. So they, mm-hmm. they and, and, and it's interesting if you think about it. I, I remember when I had my first, went for my first CIO interview, MBA wasn't a thing that was needed. But today right. that's a requirement, right? And did nobody sit up and take notice and say, but why are they asking these technical people to have MBA? So the shift already happened. That happened years ago. So I find that those who are, 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 are like get better at this or surviving longer and sort of had a lot. Because as we see ten, with CIOs, 10 years are, are very, very short. There used to be a time where the acronym stood before career is over. But so what we find is that those who are politically more astute who are, or a lot more about the business. So, for example, somebody, I see one of the questions, what's the difference between, it's a generic title, what's the difference between a healthcare CIO and a higher education CIO? If you put them somewhere and you were interviewing them, they must sound like they a business person from healthcare and talk about healthcare. If they in um, higher education or logistics, they must talk about the business and what they are doing in, in the business. If your CIO is still tinkering in the background and, you know, looking at uh, setting up data centers and, you know, focusing on the technology bits and things. They, they're they not going to be around for long. P- public sector, I know it's an unfair statement, but yeah, public sector, yes, you can still get away with that. They typically still tend to, to CFOs. But we see that more and more that boards have taken an interest in this role. So you'll find now that these these guys are... Uh, it's interesting, A, a and, and I saw it in America first, A, that they are now go more to they go to board meetings. Um, they accompany the CEO and they talk about what they are doing because they're very very interested in that. And in America, what I saw is that there was this. They started to sit on boards. It started with the startups, the you know the Mark Zuckerbergs and people like that sitting on boards. And that's an interesting thing, on, and not on startups, on on large multinational companies. So we see that that's something that's happening with with CIOs now. So in a nutshell, CIOs are more like business people. That's what they are. They're becoming more and more about business. If you still, if you're aspiring to become a CIO, which I'm seeing, in, get your MBA, start learning more about the business. Um, because if you're going to go down the technical route, then you'll end up being like a data scientist or a specialist. Nothing wrong with that. Some people love that. But if your aspiration is to become a CIO, CDO, you need to be more focused on the on the on the business the business side of things. Yeah, and I'd say that CIOs more than most roles in organizations really require a very broad skill set because you need. First of all, you, you need to understand technology and that alone, if, if even if all your focus is, is just understanding new and emerging technologies, that's just changing so fast and keeping up with all the changes that alone is, is very difficult. But then you add in the other skill sets that are so important, but yet oftentimes underrated with CIOs, things like, you know, the operational business process understanding, the the people and the change management and the, the leadership component of, of transformation those are all very different skill sets and it's hard to, it's hard to get all those skills, quite frankly. So I think that's one of the big challenges. Would you, would you agree is just sort of you know, having that, having depth, but also having that breadth of, and broad skill set that's required to be an effective leader in that role. Correct. So, um, and also that's, so yeah, so traditionally you would come through as either in programming or something, and then you ended up being a CEO. That's no longer the case now, unless you're a CTO, that's a whole different, it's different from a, C, from a CEO. It's more, more technology focused, um, but definitely a, a broader uh, uh, um a skill set and and interestingly things like um the political savviness which which means that you have you have empathy you have the ability to read a room you were mm-hmm. um and also things like uh being a good communicator so and and i've seen an instance where there was a lawyer who became a cio so you don't have to come from the traditional um it background anymore and because it, it really if you th- if you sit and you think about it and i remember doing this one day when i was a cio i said i came to the realization that i can be out outsourced from me to this entire department can be outsourced everything we're doing as we are doing it right now can be outsourced can be done 
better, cheaper, faster. So I said, how do we stay in the game? Let's go learn the business. Let's make sure that they co they won't get rid of us because we are so intertwined with the, what, what they were doing. And eventually we, we, we started to use their language. Yeah. There were still the guys who did the back office uh, type stuff. You, you'd still have that program and that would do that. And that's fine. You, you need them. But we made, made sure um, that we were starting to understand the business more and then proposing uh, solutions to them, you know, and then saying, here's the technology. That will that will help you achieve your, your what, right. what you need, because think about it. They, they, they and it's happened. I mean, I've seen I've actually just seen it with one of the clients recently. They've actually gone out and engaged with a software vendor directly, and and the CIO is in the background. Uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that actually has actually been um, asked twice now. Whoops, I try and show it if I can. Avoid my own user error here. Um, whoops, let me come back to it. Um, that is not the one I wanted to show you. Sorry. Uh, there it is. Okay. So this is uh, Diane on LinkedIn was the first one to ask this, but someone else has since asked the same question or asked again for us to cover this. But how would you define the difference between a CIO, which is Chief, Chief Information Officer, and CDO, which is typically referred to as chief yeah. uh, digital officer. How would you view that difference or how would you describe that difference? It's interesting, Eric, because it keeps coming up, this one. This one. It does. <laughs> it does, yeah. So um, so I'm going to answer it in a way that it's not unfair to all CIOs. So if you're in an organization where you have a CIO and a CDO, then you tend to find that the CIO focuses on operations um, and back office more like a chief operations officer of IT, which is also a little bit of an unfair statement because there, there, there is um, room for innovation and, and you know, uh, looking at how you increase your revenue and things like that. But it's all based around the existing business model and existing um, revenue streams and driving down cost in that business. So if that's what your business traditionally does, that's what the CIO will focus on to make sure that that, that works. If you have a CIO in that same building with that, or you can't say in the hybrid working space that we're in. If there's a CDO as well, then you'll find the CDO is chasing revenue. They're looking at, at, at other, at, 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 at other th um, you know, they're looking at AI, robotics. They're looking at the customer experience. They're looking at new business models. So they focus more on the revenue aspects and the boards pay particular attention to these guys. Now, typically when the CDO is brought in, I'm not saying it's always the case. We find it's because the CIO hasn't stepped up. We, we find that. But it's also mm -hmm. unfair because in sometimes the CDO is just better at it. They come with more of a revenue mindset. And so that's why they, they bring it in. So, uh, like I said, I didn't want to be unfair to some CIOs because I've seen CIOs in some of these large organizations and smaller ones where there is no CDO, but they've stepped up. So they've maintained the, the, the title CIO, but they are chasing new revenue streams. They are looking at different, they're outsourcing more of the back office type stuff. So um, it's, it's not so much about the title. It's about what you are doing. Mm -hmm. So you should, be fo you should be focused. If you're a CIO in a large multinational, then if, you are not if you are not chasing new revenue, new ways of, of working, um, you know, driving down costs, um, sitting at the, the boardroom and, the exco and talking about the business, you're not going to be there for very long. That's right. We've seen we've seen that. Yeah. To to come yeah. to the title, what will get you fired? That will get you fired. Right. Yeah. Well, and in, in one of the other um, roles or titles that it may seem like we're slicing hairs a little bit, but it's it's important to think this through in terms of the differences between CIO, chief digital officer. But also there's you mentioned CTO, which is generally chief, uh, chief technology officer. Technology but there's also yeah. another CTO role, which is chief transformation officer, which you're seeing more. We're seeing that more and more. It's not extremely common, but we do have, you know, a subset of our clients where they have a, a designated or a, a dedicated chief technology officer, or a, I'm sorry, chief transformation, transformation officer, officer role. Well, how, how is that different? Or is that something you've seen as well? It's not common in, in, in Africa. We've not seen that, but I would assume it sounds almost like a CDO type role. That's yeah. what it sounds like. Yeah. I'm assuming yeah. it's nothing to do with organizational change management. I would assume it's more like a CDO role. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it's it's. I think it's actually, in my opinion, it's it's sort of adding another layer of responsibility to what, in theory, should really be part of the CIO's role, which is leading change. So if you have chief transformation officer, oftentimes that's the person that's sort of like the program manager. They're the they're the leader of the transformation initiative. So if you have a large yeah. multi-year transformation initiative, some organizations will have a chief transformation officer. Maybe not as common in in Africa where you're at. But we've seen it certainly mm-hmm. in the, the Americas and Europe. You know, we've seen some clients that have that's not okay. like I said, it's not that common, but it is something we're seeing more of now than we did, you know, five or ten years ago. Interesting. We've not seen that year yet. Well, I haven't yeah. seen that. Um good. Um I was gonna actually bring up another uh question from the audience here, another another point here. Um, or it's actually just more of a, a comment. And this is from Gasan on LinkedIn. He says, shadowing IT if allowed interferes with IT governance, encourages best of breed. And best of breed encourages multiple versions of the truth, which leads us back to looking at strategies um, to address disparate systems. So, you know, this is a really interesting point. I think yeah, I kind of wanted to turn it into a question, which is if you allow that shadow IT that you mentioned before that you're talking about, or maybe put it even more broadly, you allow different pockets of the organization to sort of do their own thing, define their own path, chart their own strategy for their digital technologies, you're going to end up. Mm-hmm likely with a best of breed scenario and you're trying to you're stuck trying to patch that all together how do you mm. you know what are, what are some of the tactics or strategies you've seen organizations use to overcome that dynamic or mitigate that risk so look you could still the you're still responsible if you're the cio um and i'll give you an interesting take on why i did it when i talk about political savviness so um and and i, I just want to say when i was at gartner I, we used to run workshops we have cios and we have to talk about these different topics this was one of the most hotly contested and guys would get angry you'd get some say no no, no let it go and others are like no if you have your strong governance you can still al- allow that to happen because at some point it has to come back into you so you still maintain you still look at what they're trying to do if they are going off and trying to implement an erp system you're gonna like no mm. so you, you you need there's a fine balance right so i'll give you an example uh, so 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 that's where you bring the governance in what is it that they are doing if they are exploring front end stuff a new website uh, you, you allow that you pick your battles you you, you can't be a doctor no and try and do everything the business will bypass you the you because you'll find that especially today the reason here's the here's the the, the 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 challenging bit right the resources they can find to do stuff for them you can't get anymore or retain you you can't get that you'll get that person in and one to the out the door they can go and buy that and outsource it and so they'll do it so you just work with you partner with them so i came across this in my career and this is where political savviness came in. it was the chief operation or, or operations officer and I had a good relationship with him and he used to support each other at Exco and things like that. And then he went off and he wanted to do his own data analytics thing. I didn't have the team for it. And then I had a, my team was fighting me. Why are you allowing this to happen? And I did it for political reasons. So I stayed close to it, but I let him do his thing. And by me letting, and we worked together, eventually it came back, back to me. Imagine right. if I said to him, no, you will not do that. And you, and you know, then, so you've got to be, that's what I'm talking about. That political savviness, astuteness, it's not binary anymore. You're not in that technology world where it's binary. So when I say you have to have this um, political astuteness to be able to navigate in that, those are CROs that's going to survive because he was politically so strong. He could, he could, he could have gotten rid of me. Whether we want to talk about these things or not, it happens especially at exco level there's always, there's always somebody trying to take you out i always right. used to say when i coached are you sure you want to be a c level executive because i remember going to the boardroom thinking okay eric's got a gun this one's got a tank i better right. bring an army yeah no it's it, it gets brutal as you go up the top so you've got to be politically savvy yeah you can't yeah. you can't just oh that's it governance and and i'm going to stop you there you're not going to be around for long yeah and and speaking of um Politically savvy. Uh, this is a question from. Uh, this is a great question from Kyler, uh, our podcast co-host here, who's who's listening in the background. Uh, her question is: How important is this business focus in IT in general? Even if the CIO is business savvy, but the greater department is not, does that cause mis- misalignment? So, in other words, if I'm a CIO, I'm focused on this political savviness, on the business, on the people side of change, all this other non-technology stuff, but I'm leading a 
team, a department that's very technologically focused and they're not necessarily focused on those broader areas that we're talking about. Correct. How do you, how do you maintain that alignment? Does it create misalignment first and foremost? If so, how do we, how do we address that misalignment? It definitely could create greater lines. And I'll talk from personal experience. I joined an organization where the guys have been there for 20 odd years. You know, some of them were old, older than me. And they had this mindset of this is, this, is, um, this is the way IT operates. So I had a simple thing that I would do when I joined an organization as a CEO. I would call everybody in the room at some point was I used to do this team building things. And I would say, who is the customer? And, and you'd, be, you'd be surprised what people say. It will be, oh, it's finance, it's sales, it's logistics. So then at some point, somebody, and it's typically the younger people would say, it's the people, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the customers of the company. So then I would have to do that mind shift. Do they, do they shift and, and make that mind shift? No. So what I work on is percentages. If I can get about 60 to 80% of that floor focused on the business, the rest of them will either just have to shut up and go along with it or, but it's not possible to change all of them. Their mindset is so ingrained, but you just got to keep on at it. Now, what helps you make that change is when the, so typically if you think about it, if you go into an organization where IT is not performing, they're not delivering, they're not helping, they're not focused on the true cost, then they seem to be back office, right? So if you come in and you're making this change and there's people in your team now you, you know, it's not, not like they're cheering when they see us coming along, but they, they're more receptive to us and they see the change and people want to come and work in IT. That's what helps you because it's not about what I'm saying because if the, if, if they, if, even if they're still calling them the customer, the incredible, who's now happy and saying, this is great, we like this, that kind of keeps you at bay. You're not going to change everybody's mindset. But that's how you help make the change. It's not just you in the department, because ultimately, if you're offering a great service and, and the revenue is growing and, you know, board members are singing your praises and your team's praises and things, that helps make the change. But yeah. are you going to get 100% on board? No, it's not possible. I find. Right. Yeah. Let's get in. Well, it's almost like even if you have um, these these resources that are very heavily focused on technology, and let's just say, you know, you, you mentioned that 60 to 80 percent of them are going to come along and, and sort of transition to this more broader business focused mindset. But let's just say they don't. And you've got that subset of people that are extremely technical. They just like to build stuff. They like to they like to be techies, for lack of a better word. They don't necessarily want to deal with the people or the process or the strategy side of things. Your job as a CIO in that situation, in my opinion, is oftentimes to be sort of a business analyst or a business architect, someone that can take the business needs and objectives and translate that into something that's more technical, but aligns with what the overall, what the overarching goals and strategies of the organization are. Correct. So if you can Correct. do that well, then it's probably okay if you have a subset of people that are just technically focused, but you, it just puts more pressure on you as a leader to be able to do that translation and that uh, interpretation of what the business needs are into the technical Correct. needs. Because because you still you, you you still need them. It's not that you you don't need them, right? But they tend to be. But but definitely my leadership, uh, my business analyst. I would walk my floor sometimes, and I would say, "Why are these business analysts sitting on my floor? They shouldn't be here. They should be out there, right. unless you're typing up some requirements or something." So it's 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 so it's that subset, you know, your leadership team, and that when they're out there, they must be focused on the business. If there's someone at the back who likes there to, to, to do reports and things like that, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, but they can't be front facing. It's not right. going to work. It's, it's not going to work. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Did you ever see the movie um, Office Space uh, back in the 90s? Was that was that movie popular in, in, in Africa? Uh, what was it about? Can you remind it's, me? It's the one where they, it's a, it's a comedy and it's the one where they, um, they uh they they work for a tech company in the late 90s um and they long story short they're trying to retire early so they come up with a scheme to take uh to skim transactions in the financial system to take money and basically get rich that way and they wanted to use that to retire and then they get caught so it's just a okay. whole story but it's it's more than that it's a story about the internal office politics and things of that nature and there's a character in it in uh Jennifer Aniston from the show Friends she's she's in the movie She's probably the best known actress in the show or in the movie. But in the movie, there's a character. I forgot his name, but he's like the translator from what the customer wants to what the engineering group has to do. 
and these mm. these uh, efficiency consultants come in and start questioning everyone's jobs, like why are you doing what you do, and you know how many people could we cut to save money in this organization? And they start asking this guy questions about, well, what is it you really do? Is it, is it are you just translating the customer needs into the engineering needs, and why doesn't the customer just go directly to the engineer? And he sort of has mm. a meltdown in the movie, and it's meant to be funny, but it's kind of true. He has a meltdown mm-hmm. because he says, you know, I'm good with people and I, I understand people and that's my role and that's my value. <laughs> but it's a really funny scene in the movie, but funny. it kind of reminds me what, what we're talking about here reminds me of that because that is sort of what the CIO has to do is you have to take all these crazy ideas that the business has and you then have to translate it into something that the IT group can do. And if you don't have that effective CIO role there, you, you sort of, yeah, you cut out the middle man, but you need that middle yeah. man and middle woman there to be able to, to translate those needs Correct. to the organization. So here's what's, what's interesting in, in, in how you put that. You said it's to, as the CIO, you have to translate what the business wants and then make it happen. Here's what's what's interesting is to bring us back to the, to the topic of what's going to get you fired. It's flipped now. You have to tell the business. You, right. you have to, and you have to make sure your army is going to follow you to go and do what you need to do. So it is a bit of a balancing. It's, it's a little bit of Great both. Point. Yeah, there's always, they, they come and they'll tell you this is our strategy, things like that. Um, but you'll find that a lot more now CROs will be leading. So yeah. if, if we look at like one of our banks who won the most innovative award a few years back was where the CIO, a, a CEO realized the importance of IT. So you brought them to the foreground. I always used to say that if if you go to these strategy sessions and you on day two, the last person to present as the CIO, <laughs> you're in trouble. Right. Because it's like, oh, this is our strategy. You just need to enable it. It's flipped now because you need to tell them, but we can use AI now. We should be using chatbots now on the front. We should be, yeah. So that that's that's the change that I'm seeing. Yeah. We we'll started great, already. That's a great point. It's sort of a, you're right. It's a back and forth. It's a balancing act. You, you have business needs that are known by the organization that you have to translate into technical needs, but then there's emerging technologies, newer technologies that the business may not even know about or realize could help Correct. improve their business. So you have to, you have to know the business well enough and follow the business well enough to also be able to lead the business to say, you know, you could use robotic process automation or human capital management software, or whatever, whatever the needs are. There's all these different technologies out there you could be deploying. So that's more of the technical piece, you know, being able to recognize where the technology could best fit within the business. And within fit the in that, yeah. So it's also a difficult role. I'm just thinking now because a lot of it is about shifting mindsets. So I, I coined this, I mean, I didn't coin the term, uh, Gartner coined the term and I used it. I uh, said I was a digital evangelist. So um, so you, you almost have to go out and, and hammer at the board level at the, you know, even within your own team to make the shift to digital digital right. doesn't just happen because you've got a great digital strategy it happens because people want to make that change it's a huge part of that that change that you have to do so i think the role is becoming even more difficult now actually, yeah if you i think agree about there's, it, there's mm. just a lot of a lot of stuff you need to know and be good at to to be effective in that in mm. that role um Here's another question, and maybe it's or a comment that I'll I'll turn into a question here. This is from Cosmos on uh, LinkedIn, and Cosmos says, "I got confused when the company I used to work for hired a CIO, and they have a VP of IT report to him. He wondered what each would be doing. Um, so I guess maybe I'll just broaden that question a bit and say, you know, you've got VP of IT, you have IT manager, IT director, CIO, chief digital officer, chief technology officer, chief transformation officer. You have all these different." technical roles i mean how do you do you have any advice on how to make sense of it all i mean every organization is different which you, which you already mentioned and every organization might define these roles differently but you know how do you how do you mm-hmm. navigate this the, the complexities of just the organization the it organization in general so it's interesting i was talking to somebody that i hadn't worked with in years and he said he phoned me about something and he was he was talking he said he watched the li- our last live stream and he said i liked what you said and there was he said you said um, I think I said one of my pet peeves is the title. So I think it's important to not let the title hold you back. And I think it's got to the point now where people are even making fun of it, right? They've come up with chief something, this, or chief, yeah. So I think it's important to not let the title hold you back. You've got to understand, okay, this is why I'm here and this is my role. But I think we mustn't get so caught up in it. And I'll tell you why, because we're in a state of flux. Because years ago, 
the CDO role came out and I said, no, it's not going to work. And I was even arguing with Gartner at the time. I wasn't working with them. And I said, it's because the CIO owns um, the army. He owns the IT department. So you bring this poor CDO and make all these changes and the guy can just go like, no, it's not going to happen. But that's changed, right? Because now the CDO can say, okay, it's fine. I don't need you. He can go to the market. You can get, you can, whatever you, you can, he's got access to global resources. So it's flipped. So I think we must be careful that we don't get too caught up. So, so if you think about it, what stayed consistent at COO, which is, I'll come to that one, actually, if, if we've got time to come, it's interesting. The COO role, CFO, CEO role has kind of remained, if you think about it, almost the same, you could say. That's more or less where they are. I know I'm doing them a disservice, and hopefully there's nobody who's going to say, "What else?" <laughs> right. of, of course, we've changed, and yeah. and I do, and I do. Um, I'm actually also a trained cost and management accountant, so I don't mean anything disrespectful by that. But they kind of, you kind of know what they are, right? But the CIO role is an evolving role, is a changing role. I mean, uh, when last did we hear that the CEO is an evolving role? Or a CFO is in a role. But now, so so obviously we're coming up with this, like, what are we now? CTO, CRO, CDO. But I, I think the point I'm trying to make is whatever your title is, if it's a senior executive role and it's in a large organization, typically you need to focus on the business and use IT to drive revenue, drive down cost, grow the business and be a senior executive. That's that's what you need to get you know, to, 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 to understand. What I have seen was interesting. I've seen this in, in Africa where a CIO reports to a CTO. Right. And the reason that happened was because they couldn't get rid of the CIO, but they needed to bring somebody into this. Okay, we'll call you CTO and then make the CIO report to you. So I think we must be careful not to get too caught up in it. Um, I think we're kind of lucky in IT that we flew it. We've changed over the years. So the CIO title will, I think I said it on the long, will be called something else. It's will be moved on. It will, it's going to change anyway. Yeah, it's a it's a misleading title, in my opinion, to call it chief information mm. officer. I don't think that's... It doesn't, it doesn't make sense anymore. Yeah, in the 80s, it, it did, because that's what you're yeah. focused on is information and how do we digitize, you know, just basic computerization of our of our data and our, our systems. But now it's 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 evolved quite a bit. Um mm. And also, you know, I, it's it's an interesting point though because I, I now that we're talking about it, I guess I've never I haven't thought that much about this until this conversation. But it does seem like organizationally, a lot of organizations make the mistake of wiring the organizational structure around the weaknesses of the leader they have in place now. So, you, so in other words, a lot of times we work with clients where they have an IT director, or maybe they call them CIO, that have been in that role for say twenty years, and they are tasked with leading some sort of transformation. We need to overhaul our systems or put in new technologies or just get caught up to the 21st century. And that person doesn't have the skill set or the competency. So they end up creating another role like a chief, you know, transformation officer or a, a chief digital officer, whatever it is. And it's almost like it's, it's, there's a fine line between augmenting the skill sets you don't have versus a key leadership role like that, where the person in the leadership role doesn't have the right skill set. So you end up creating another leadership role, which will inevitably over time get sucked into the status quo because that person that had been there for 20 years and the CIO role is probably going to revert back to what they know best and back to their comfort zone. So you have to sort of rethink, do you have the right person in that role to begin with? Um, mm -hmm. Do you maybe need to put in someone over that person that used to be a, an effective CIO, but now that the role has evolved, that person hasn't been able to keep up. Maybe you need someone over them that, that sort of uh, provides that and that's that's obviously a very messy correct organizational dynamic but it seems like more organizations need to be a little more strategic rather than just throwing a band-aid on the problem mm, correct um so along those lines then you know speaking of cios and uh you know developing the skill set you need to be more effective in the 2020s versus what it took in the 1980s or 1990s when the role was first emerging this is from diane on mm. linkedin uh, she asked any specific education paths that you would recommend for the cio role there's quite a few CIO specific courses. Would those be more would those be more applicable than an MBA? So maybe just in general, what what sort of training and uh, upskilling would you recommend that CIOs or CIO aspiring CIOs uh, might go through? So I would say yes, uh, MBA is, is is not a bad thing to have, and we find that more and more. Um, you know, when they advertise for these positions, they will say MBA, right or Bachelor of Commerce in Science or Informatics or, or that. 
Um, I think if you could, like the more business courses you could do makes sense. And and especially, let's say if you're in an organization where you say, I'm, I'm in financial services, then it makes sense to do financial services courses, right? To, to, so that you can start to, to, to um, you know, play a bigger role. And don't overlook things like, uh, let some of us are just born naturally, uh, that they can just do this, uh, which is public speaking, uh, communication, because it's going to push you more and more into the limelight in that role. So it's important to do the soft skills. I would say um, there are a lot of CIO um, courses out there. I would say be wary, um, rather go with the more established ones. I like the ones, for example, so I've had a few um, of uh, people who worked for me over the years who went on these courses. And they, for example, they flew to America to Silicon Valley and then got worked with some of the startups there. I thought that's that's great, right? But if you're going to do an online CIO course, it's not really going to teach you how to be a CIO. CIO. There is no one answer to this. I mean, if you just heard, I said I'm a qualified cost and management accountant, but I'm also in IT. But it helped me with budgeting and things like that. So I think MBA definitely tick that one. If you want to do a CIO course, make sure it's something reputable. Ask around, see what, and go and look at what they're actually going to do, right? Well, what are they actually going to, going to offer you on this that an MBA might offer you? Because everybody climbs on the bandwagon and they say, oh, CIO, and then uh, um, uh, education and then just teach you the bland sort of sort of stuff. But I think the other important thing is don't, um, you know, look at the soft skill stuff. Do those, try and get an executive coach, for example, that will help you. But right. but you need to be almost like an all-rounder. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, you know, a shameless plug for some of Third Stage's content. Uh, Third Stage Consulting, the company that you and I both work for, has quite a bit of content out there that's meant to be educational, informative, and helping CIOs and leaders, um, you know, just understand some of the technologies and some of the digital strategies that are most effective in, in today's world. So if you go to the third stage, either third stage consulting and or my own personal YouTube channels and LinkedIn pages, both of those are, are good avenues that, you know, we post different content on those two channels. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend checking out both my personal uh, LinkedIn and YouTube, as well as uh, the third stage consulting LinkedIn and YouTube channels too, because there's, we're always putting stuff out there every, every day we put new, new content out or most, most days of the week, there's new content being put out there. Um, so that's, that's good stuff. Um, I was going to ask you, Oh, I wanted to bring up a, another comment from Kyler because she's trying to stir <laughs> the pot here. You know, she's behind the scenes. We can't see her, but here she is. She's, she's kind of throwing uh, grenades at us here uh, as, as we're in the live stream, which I like um, she's saying, so which, what Kyler is saying is maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but when it comes to flexibility and overall ability to change, I'd say CIOs are one of the leadership positions that are least likely to have any appetite for change. And boom, she just threw it out there just like that. So what are your, uh, what are your thoughts? Do you agree? Do you disagree? And why? I say it's a uh, dip because like I always say, we can't brand everybody the same, right? So you can put C in, and, and I come from, I worked with like 30 CIOs at one at any point in time or run workshops with 20 or 30 CIOs in the room. So yes, you might have the title, but don't, and don't forget you're also dealing with the human being. So some of us are more prone to change. So I, I don't think it's got anything to do with the title that the fact that you're a CIO and that you, and that you're not willing to change. It depends on the individual. It depends where you are in your, I mean, if you've been a CIO at the same company for 20 odd years, which we have seen, I've seen CIOs retire from the same way, they le they're less likely to change. But if I show you a 30 something chief digital officer, <laughs> very likely to change. So, so boom back at you, kind of. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Throw us another one. <laughs> right. Well, here's another uh, here's another bombshell uh, while we're on the thread here, and this is from from Sam on LinkedIn. I really like this question as well, and it's 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 sort of taking a dig at uh, executive teams throughout the world. Uh, so I'd be curious to get the audience's perspective on this too. But I'll ask you first, Ridwan: mm. Is there a problem when CIXOs who can build a spreadsheet think they know more than the CIO, CDO, or CTO? 
which I think is a super funny question, but yet very relevant, very true. Um, you get you it's know, a people... funny. Um, so I would have come across this kind of a problem. I was never CEO of a smaller organization, but coming through the ranks as a support person or what we used to they used to call us. We remember system administrators, or yeah, and then we became like IT managers. Yes, then I would deal with those kind of individuals. So that was many, many, many years ago. But once you start working for the bigger organizations and that, I didn't, I didn't come across that. So it'd be interesting what the audience say. What I, what I did come across, what I used to call the brother-in-law syndrome. So um, you would be at the office and then your, your CEO would come and call you to his office to talk to you about some new thing that his brother-in-law, when they were on the, on, when they were playing golf, he told him about. <laughs> Right. Yeah, about this thing called chat button and like why are you guys not doing it and then that's what i used to call brother-in-law syndrome but i think this is something different right so basically you're saying you've and it's interesting um because let's be honest if you're a cio that's been in the game for a long time you are faced with a workforce because i think we've got something like three different generations in the workplace now you are faced with uh younger people there they are might be more technology savvy than than you it's, it is. So what, what do you have to back yourself up is your leadership skills, your experience. So that's how you back that back. But I've never had that where a CEO said, I'm good at a spreadsheet, so I know more than you. I'd like right. to hear what the audience says. I've never come across that. Right. As a yeah, CEO, and I, no. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, maybe a way to broaden that question or statement is just a, you know, lack of understanding of, technologies of what modern technologies can do beyond what a spreadsheet can do and and how do you you know when an executive thinks they've got the answers they, they think they have it figured out but they don't fully understand the technology um i mm. you know maybe that's the broader question there um you know i don't know if and that's that again is more no, sorry but again that's more of a personality thing isn't it i mean it doesn't yeah. matter and i can tell you now that guy is telling you see if oh he knows more than the cfo and he's telling his whoever i'm no more than you and he's telling <laughs> yeah <laughs> right, right, and here's uh, you you have at least one person uh, on the line that agrees with a comment you made earlier, Ridwan, and this is from Donald on LinkedIn. He says, "You don't know the craziness I see from the executive level in the government," <laughs> um, and that is yeah. followed. It, that kind of builds on what you'd said earlier, but this is actually an even more uh, important point that he makes as a follow up. This is also from Donald on LinkedIn. He says they think IT is only help desk, um, and that's a I think that's an, a, a difficult mindset shift, not just for IT leaders, but also for organizations in general, is to view mm -hmm. IT not as a help desk, not as just a support function, but more of a strategic enabler of the organization. How do you, I know it's a big yeah. question, but how do you how do you recommend organizations navigate that that challenge? So it's, it's going to be a bit unfair what I'm, how I'm going to answer, but also... Um, I'll give another perspective of why things are the way that sometimes, right? So that my initial reaction to that is, well, then this your CIO should be more strategic, right? Which we know. If if you're in a multinational, let's think about it. Let's choose one of the big multinationals. And they think IT is only help desk. Something wrong with that CIO, right? Because he's got the opportunity to be whatever or she or she. But I think Donald's talking about it in government, and, and I've had the experience in government. Yes, then I understand that because they do have a different mindset, a different. It's not profit driven; it's more politically motivated. And you typically find in government that, and it's interesting that CIOs not only report to and have the title CIO, not only report to the CFO, they also report to the um, corporate services executive, not even the COO. So they're seen as a corporate services. So that's where that mindset, oh, it's just just to help thing. Because let's be honest, in government, uh, uh, how crazy can you can you get? Actually, you know, right. you, you can't. And the other problem you have there is that your leadership. Well, we see that in Africa, changes very often in in government. There's a there's a quick, there's a lot of churn at that right. level. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see CIOs make? Um, and, and that you've seen them make in, in recent years? So I think when they become complacent. So um, if you think, and I think I spoke about it a lot, of time, it's this thing of urgency, addiction. So, and I had it coming through IT. I came through the help desk. You wait for something to go wrong or, or you go and think so that something can go wrong. It's that right. to get, yeah. So what, what I find is that you've, 
you can't wait. You can't be an audit taker. Don't sit back and wait for the business to ask you for something. You, so I've done that. That was great, right? Um, we rolled out X number of laptops in uh, and everybody is, fa that's fantastic. But you got to go back to, once you've done that, you you can't just rest on your laurels. You got to go and look for something else now. How, how, what else can I do? How else can I make a difference in the business? Because I think the thing that I find, especially when the guys get older, is when th when things start humming and you have something like a 99% uptime, they tend to, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait it out now. <laughs> I'm chilling, you know. Um, I, I think that's the mistake that, uh, that I see. I think those days are gone. But you can sit back and wait for your retirement. You're going to be taken out. I right. think that's, yeah, they need to now keep up on their game all the right. time. I think that's important. Right, right. Um, what about, um, you know, making sure that, they have buy-in into their changes and into the transformations. How, what are some of the tactics or strategies that that CIOs can use to ensure that they they have that level of buy-in as they as they lead change in their organizations? To get the buy-in. So the important thing is uh, what we call business value of IT, right? So everything that you're talking, everything that you're presenting, um, even when you're presenting a budget of why you're doing something, the, your output is always focused on what they're trying to achieve as an organization. So it's, it's, it's important that when you're sitting, and, and I'm guilty of it when I started out as a CIO, is to sit in the exec, and when the CFO, CIO used to start talking, I used to switch off. <laughs> it's like I'll wait for my turn. <laughs> but those days are gone, so you've got to listen to what everything is happening around you all the time. So that when you come in and you sell something, you're talking there, using their language, then also, depending on which organization you're in, it's... Um, they also use technical language or using their language and making sure that you have a relationship with them. That's very important. Like I use that example of the CRO. We used to support each other on certain initiatives, you know, um, and that's why I kind of like, allowed him to do his shadow IT so that when I came and said, hey, I want to do this. So it's about being politically savvy, being aware, um, because sometimes you think, man, this is a great thing. AI is the best thing for this company ever. You know, I've done all the research. I've, I've looked at all the white papers. And then you come in and you try and sell it like that. Like, what the hell? You got to talk to, what are they saying? Change management? I mean, the heart, minds, and feet. I think it is. So th that's what you need to do. So you have to be a bit of a change agent and understand these human traits, I think. To get yeah. them to make the change, people don't change because it's the right thing to do. People right. change because they 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 feel passionate about it or they want to make the change. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Here's a comment from LinkedIn: uh, Being purely reactive has come and gone. You have to focus on how to be proactive and only be reactive on those edge cases. Hundred um, percent. That yeah. makes a lot of sense given everything we're talking about, about how the role has evolved uh, since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. that, that's definitely true uh, here today. Um, so I guess just to, uh, you know, one, one more question, then I'll have sort of a, a, a capstone question to, to come uh, to, to follow up on. Uh, but what tech trends should CIOs be most aware of in the 2020s? So we haven't really, we've sort of touched on a few different things like AI and yeah. uh, robotic process automation and stuff like that. But what are some yeah. of the different um, what are some of the different um, things that we should be aware of or, or challenges we should be aware of or, or I'm sorry trends we should be aware of with with technology? So I think this whole it's, I mean it's very topical at the moment and it's a real thing. It's uh, the whole hybrid working, right? It's, it's 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 people being able to work anywhere. I think that's that's like a very very important right now, and I think it's going to be top of mind because of um, retaining talent, things like that. Um, um, my stepson is in IT and he's very upset because he has to go back to an office. So somebody like him uh, could decide, hey, I'm going to do hybrid work. So I, I think it's important to to in, to enable that. You know, how, how do you how do you enable that as as a CEO of hybrid working for employees? And then I want to turn the thing about what tech trends you should be watching. And and I'm, and, and I'll tell you why I'm going to say it like this. So remember, I come from Gartner. We used to have this top ten technology trends and and, and all these trends. And and I can say it now because I've left. A lot of those trends are not relevant to you. 
So the way you need to look at this is from a customer perspective, which uh, Drucker, Peter Drucker used to call the outside in. How does your customer interact with your with you? Right? What is it in? Then what are the tech trends that's gonna then change that? And then on the other end, you look at it the way Steve Jobs said. He said the customer doesn't know what he wants. So I will create these kind of things. So I think yeah. when you look at this stuff, don't get caught up in the in the hype. Yes, there's some stuff we can't deny. Becoming data-driven organizations. People ask me, why did I do digital transformation? I said, I'm putting things in place because I want the data. Because the data, then I could give it to AI. If I had the data, I could start predicting. So I think that's that's the important thing is, 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 is look at it not so much from what are the technology trends, what are the customer trends, what's happening with your customer. And then you apply your technology to that. It's a, And then it's a little bit of both. And you look at, so, so what are some of the important trends? I think it's that whole hybrid working so that people can work work from everywhere. AI most definitely is not going away. If anything, it's going. Uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, uh, the metaverse. Uh, people still laugh at me when I talk about that. But, you know, if Snoop Dogg is in there, <laughs> it's the place It's the place to be. It's, so it's um, starting to get mainstream if he's uh, embracing it. Yeah, it's slowly but slowly but surely. So... I think, yeah, uh, look at it like that from your cloud, from what is your customer? What is he, what is impacting on your customer in terms of technology trends and then go there and then make sure you're in that space. Because if you're not, your competitor is going to be there while you playing around with this latest technology in-house. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I think it's, it's uh, you hit a good point, which is there's a fine line between um adopting emerging technologies where appropriate, where the business needs are but it's there's a temptation to go too far and to go too far down the the steve jobs path which is let's envision something that the organization could adopt to and and you want some of that but if you go too far what ends up happening is you end up with a bunch of shelfware you over invest in a bunch of technology that you can't get business value out of steve jobs I, you know it's easy to emulate or to want to emulate steve jobs but he really mm-hmm. was a um you know, sort of a once in a lifetime sort of technology leader. You know, most people don't just aren't at that level, you know, and not to dismiss the intelligence of the rest of us in the world, but he's just on a whole mm. different uh, plant planet really in terms of intelligence and his vision. So Correct. you can have some Steve jobs. You just don't want to go too far because if you get too far, um, if you try to go too far down that path, we see a lot of organizations that, you know, mm. like metaverse is a great example. If you could double down on the metaverse right now, but what are you going to do with it as a business? Mm. You know, what, what mm. you're going to sit on that technology and try and figure it out for years and maybe it'll pay off someday, but there's also a likelihood that you distract the organization, you overinvest in technology that's not mature yet. It it's doesn't support money. your business needs and it creates a lot of challenges. So I think there's mm. a, a balancing act that's, that's needed. there. hundred percent. Mm. Yeah. So, so I guess the last question I have for you, just to wrap up the conversation here is what is the biggest single piece of advice that you would give to either it's to people that are already CIOs or. Um, people that are aspiring to be a CIO, what what advice or what 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 takeaways would you leave them with so they could be more successful in their jobs? So, so I think it's leadership, right? So this whole thing about transformative leadership. So move away from it's been around for a while. So move away from the whole transactional leadership to more trans transformational lead, leadership. Um, you, and then it's about like. What, almost like what we're doing now. It's like getting your profile out there, um, doing more public speaking, getting, you know, seen as a thought leader, you know, that, that kind of thing, because that's what actually organizations are looking for as well. They want the CIOs to be at the front of so that people are interested in their companies because it's a way of revenue generation down the line. Oh, this is a thought leader. This is a great company. And also to attract talent to, to your company. So still do the courses, you know, the, the your, your IT courses that if you're coming through the ranks, because uh, I'm, I'm sure both you and South Eric will tell any youngster that pay your school fees. <laughs> Right. Yeah, come through the ranks and it's always stood me in good stead because that's why I could manage so many diverse individuals in my department because I did most of their jobs. Um, But I think the other important thing is become more business savvy as well. Start figuring out business savvy. And the thing I want to to, to say is it's, um, I can't remember his name now. He said the ability to learn, unlearn and relearn. That's the most important thing, especially in a CIO role. It's it's constantly changing. 
Mm. It's not for the faint-hearted. So if you think it's a role that I'm going to reach this and then once I'm there, I'm, I'm good, then it's not for you. It's it's a constantly changing, reinventing yourself type type of role. Right. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. That's a great place to leave it. You know, constantly reinvent reinvent yourself and push your boundaries to learn more. And and if you're not strong in certain areas, like the, you know, the the political piece of it or the the people change management side of things, the operational business process side of things, whatever it is, you know, just really push yourself to expand your horizons on that front, which is, you could say that for any role in any organization, but especially the CIO Correct. role. I think especially so. yeah. Mm. yeah. Especially well, good. Well, yeah. well, that's a great place good. to leave it. I want to thank you for your time here today, Ridwan. And thank you. Uh, really appreciate having you here again today. Uh, to great. the audience, thank you for being here too. And th thanks for the great questions. We had some really good conversation here. So really appreciate it. Um, again, you can find this interview will get edited and baked into our weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast, which comes out every Wednesday. You can find new episodes on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, as well as all the audio podcast platforms. So if you don't subscribe to Transformation Ground Control, I highly encourage you to be sure to share it with your colleagues. It's a great learning resource. We, we do about two, we typically do two plus hours uh, in each episode every week. So there's tons of different guests and content that we cover in those episodes. So we encourage you to check that out. So thank you everyone for being here. Hope you all have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next Tuesday on our next weekly live stream. Have a great week in the meantime. Right. Take care. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.